Harvest time is the season of favor. And uh, let me just give you a natural analogy to a spiritual point. In the natural, when you sow seeds, you sow them for an appropriate time. And uh, you sow them, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 verse 1 says, to everything there is a season and a time for every matter or purpose under heaven. There's a time to live, a time to die. There's a time for every single thing. Jesus told us that there was, a, there was a farmer who doesn't know how the seed that he planted grows because the seed is underground and you can't see it germinating. You can't see it growing. So the Bible says, uh, Jesus said that the farmer, he doesn't know how it grows, but that he has faith and expectation that what he put in the ground will one day turn out to be his crop. And that's the way Christianity is. We have to live our lives in a constant place of faith where what we've sown, we trust, will come back. And we believe that we can't see it, but we believe it's coming. How do you hear that? And you need to understand that you're living your life uh, in a daily cycle of a wash machine sort of effect. And you're spinning around and you're going through all this and you've, uh, you've sown and then you never see the reaping. And you wonder why isn't there any reaping in my life? Why is it that God would take uh, two men and bless one and not bless another? God is not a respecter of man. God uses, uh, he chooses to bless uh, those that he chooses to bless, but God blesses us. Come on now. And we can have his favor. A harvest is a season or a time of favor, which can be an opportunity, a connection, finances, relationships, or blessings which God brings into the believer's life at certain times to meet the needs and the desires of our hearts as a result, key, key word now, as a result of the seed which we have sown. A season of time, a season of favor. So now that favor, that harvest had some, some opportunity. How many of you know opportunity is a wonderful thing? God sends divine appointments. And I've shared each week how God orchestrates divine sovereign appointments. He's put me before kings and presidents. He's put me in the right places at the right times where the glory of God could be manifest. And uh, so many times and so many revivals and so many moves of God uh, for his choosing, he chose me to be able to be there when those outpourings happened. And, and, and that's how God will favor us. He'll cause the opportunities uh, that the world is killing for, for them to come your way. Have you say, Lord, thank you. Uh, you're going to bring increase my way. And the world is trying to fight to get that increase. But God uh, can cause increase to come uh, unexpected, sovereignly. When you didn't know it was coming, uh, God can show up. My daughter uh, went to go back to school the end of August. She was going back to Boston where she was in college. And uh, uh, it was time and we had to pay that time we had to pay $10,000 like that day, that week to get her back in school. She came to me, dad, I gotta have that. I gotta have it by. And she gave me the date and it must've been a Friday or something or Monday or something. I guess it was Friday. She had to be there that weekend so she could uh, get ready for school. And I just kept telling her, sweetheart, I'm going to have it. I know God's going to open the door. Oh, dad, I got it. I got to be able to go. Back. I got it. We got it covered. Let's pray. Don't worry. Let's pray. Let's trust God. And I'm over there going, oh, God. <laughs> well, the beauty of that is God has a wonderful way of putting you in the need of dependency upon him. Some of you are codependent upon drugs and upon alcohol and upon other things. And some of you are codependent on individuals uh, that you are attached to in wrong relationships. But I found that I'm addicted to, to attachments that comes from him. And I know he's my source. 
And so I just kept saying, look, kid, you got to trust God. I'm trusting God. You trust God. And that Friday went to the mailbox and boom, there was a check in there. Now, the reason I say that was a man had died about three or four years before that I grew up in the neighborhood with. I was uh, near him. I knew him. He was a dear man in my life, both before and after. Uh, his wife was an intercessor. She had prayed with me since I was five years old. And even when my mother died, she was praying for me. When my dad died, she was praying for me. When I was in and out of jail, she was praying for me. When I beat up her three sons, she was praying for me. When I was always in trouble, she was praying for me. Her husband, uh, he was the first one when I got saved. He couldn't believe I was saved. So he came to church that Sunday to see if I was really saved. Ended up joining the church I was saved in and later became an elder in that church. He owned a massive company and he actually bought me my first suit I ever owned. In the process of that, God is so good. He died and I would have never, ever asked, seen, known. He put a check in his will for me for $10,000. But it took three years to get to me. How many of you know when Abraham went up the mountain, the ram was already assigned to come up the other side? He was coming up the other side while Abraham is there and he's going to possibly sacrifice his child because God told him to bring the child up and offer him. But you see, it may not come according to your clock. But God, the minute you ask, he sends the blessing before you could even. There are two keys to look at in harvest and harvest favor. You start becoming more sensitive, number one. You start becoming more sensitive and alert and more discerning uh, to the opportunities. So that's the first one. Uh, the key here for a harvest favor, for you to walk in that favor, is that God will make you alert and make you more sensitive that the favor of God uh, could be coming your way. And uh, the, the contacts and all that you come in touch with and the favor and the blessing that's coming in your life. And the second thing that happens is your environment. So you have opportunity and you have environment. If you're a farmer, you have to believe for the opportunities of a good rainstorm to water your gardens, etc., etc. There's a story today that will help me kind of say what I'm going to say here and just uh, finish this up. But I came across it some years ago. It's called uh, The Poor Farmer and the Chessboard. Kind of an unlikely combination. The Poor Farmer and the Chessboard. Now listen good. There was a poor farmer who faithfully attended his field. Although he was poor, he was also very, very clever and was a great fan of the game of chess. One day he was working in his field and his pitchfork, with his pitchfork, turning over the dry stalks of grain, gathering the hay into the bales so he could feed his animals. And on the road that went by his field, he could see far off in the distance a beautiful white coach drawn by four white horses coming down the road. There was only one coach like that in the entire country, and it was the coach of the king. And at the same time, just across the road, sneaking behind some bushes, he saw three low-life characters. They looked like thugs, coarse, vulgar, and violent men. As the coach came closer, the three villains jumped out in the middle of the road with their arms linked, knowing the horses would not trample over these human beings. These men clearly planned to stop the coach and rob whoever was inside. Our poor but clever farmer, who was a, a great fan of chess, was also very brave. He took his pitchfork, he jumped over the fence onto the road, and he charged the three villains, scaring them away. And the coach pulled up to where the farmer stood. The door opened and out stepped the most beautiful young woman the farmer had ever seen. She was the only daughter of the king, the princess, the sole heir of the kingdom. And the princess said, oh, I am so grateful to you. These evil men were trying to stop the coach and rob me, or even worse. You scared them away. My father, the king, will want to hear about your bravery 
and will want to reward you. You must come with me to the castle. The poor, clever, far, a brave farmer who was a fan of chess replied, I'm not worthy to come with you in your beautiful coach to the castle. She insisted. At the castle, the servants cleaned up the farmer, gave him a change of clothes, and brought him before the king. And when they brought the farmer before him, the king said, ask me any rewards you want. And whatever it may be, anything except the kingdom, and I'll give it to you right here and now. The king was thinking, this man is brave and my daughter is beautiful. Perhaps he will ask uh, for her hand in marriage. <laughs> Perhaps he will ask for her hand in marriage. She is obviously fond of him. It would be a good match. But our friend, the poor farmer, clever and brave and a great fan of chess, said, King, I'm not worthy to receive from you any great reward. There is only one thing I would ask of you. Let there be brought here a chessboard. I must have the wrong idea about this man, the king said to himself. He could ask for anything, even the hand of my daughter in marriage. If he had done that, he would have been king in the next generation. Instead, he asked for a chessboard. Does he want to play chess with me? The king gave the command and the servants brought the chessboard into his throne room. Now the farmer said, let this be my reward and let there be taken one grain of wheat and may it be put on the first square of the chessboard. And then on the second square of the chessboard, let there be placed two grains of wheat. And on the third square of the chessboard, let there be put four grains. And on the fourth, let there be put eight. And so on and so on. The king's servant put one grain of wheat on the first square, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the fourth, 16 on the fifth, 32 on the sixth, and so on. And soon every something very strange began to happen. By the time they came to the 20th square, there were 64 squares on a chessboard. They weren't dealing with grains of wheat anymore. They were dealing with full sacks of wheat. It was one sack, two sack, four sack, eight sack. By the time they hit the 35th square of the chessboard, they weren't dealing with sacks anymore. They were dealing with storehouses. It was one storehouse, two storehouse, four storehouse and on. Long before they ever came to the 64th square, the king had run out of grain. He was forced to pull all of his personal wealth into balance. He gave his daughter's hand in marriage. And since he still could not complete the reward to fulfill the word of his promise, he had to turn over his kingdom to the farmer, not in the next generation, but now. The farmer understood the principle of the mathematical miracle of multiplication. How many of you know if you win a soul to the Lord, one soul ends up two, two ends up four, four ends up eight, eight ends up 16, multiply begins to happen. How many hear that? Now Acts chapter 19, verse 10, verse 10. And it says, this continued, uh, this is Paul now, and they're in this Asian outreach here. Watch. This continued for two years so that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia, Jews as well as Greeks, heard the word of the Lord concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation uh, in the kingdom of God. Keep going. And God did unusual and extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Go on. So that handkerchiefs or towels or aprons which had touched his skin were carried away and put upon the sick and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. How many of you know, saints, that was a powerful revival. In the book of Acts there, that is the story of Ephesus and what happened in that outpouring. Now, 
It's so amazing to me to look at this and see we have two kinds of evangelism here. We have demonstration brought about by the announcement, by the heralding, uh, by the fact uh, that they use presentation. I mean, you know, the presentation of your witness, the presentation of the gospel to those that are perishing is what can be accompanied by the miracle of God when you're walking in faith. How many of you know there are people that you run into every day that need to believe that God can do something for them? Come on, there's people every day that you run in contact with that they need a supernatural miracle. And how many of you know an act of faith? I prayed with someone here this week and I took a, 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 a tissue out of the box and put oil in it. I prayed over it and she prayed over it, gave it to her to give to someone that was very ill so that God might use that to touch somebody that couldn't make it here. Now, how many of you know, saints, when you run into people, this is what Paul was doing. Paul was not only uh, telling people about Jesus, he was demonstrating the power of God. Acts 19, and go back to verse eight, thank you. And he went into the synagogue, and for three months he spoke boldly, persuading and arguing and pleading about the kingdom of God. Look at that, saints. Paul, he, he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. See, Paul didn't have just enticing words of men's intellect, but he came in the power and demonstration of the anointing. Some of you that are afraid of everything, you need to bind that thing because the day is coming where you're going to find out you better decide what you believe. Go to verse nine, look at this. And it says, and when the some became more and more stubborn, hardened and unbelieving, discrediting and reviling and speaking evil of the way. Now you gotta get this, the way was what they called the Christians. They weren't called Christians, they were called the way. That's the first move of God, then the church, the early church was not called Christians till later. And, and, and that came from Rome, and that meant small. That's what they meant when they said uh, the emperor of Rome called them Christians because they were small. And so, you know, we use that word today in a different context, but still, it's still the truth of that word is smallness. But the way, how many of you know when you say you're the way, it means there ain't no other way? Hello? And that's what they were called. They were called the way evil speaking, speaking evil of the way of the Lord before the congregation, he separated himself, come on, from them, taking the disciples with him and he went on a holiday or holding daily discussions. Hello? Yeah. He went on a holiday. Some of you don't even hear me. <laughs> went on a holiday. Some of you looked for holiday. Paul was looking for opportunity. Look at this, holding daily discussions, daily discussions in the lecture room of the Tyrrhenius uh, from about 10 o'clock till three. From 10 in the morning till three, every day Paul was there and he was bringing the Greek philosophers. He was bringing all these uh, people with great minds and he was there debating them on the fact that Jesus was the Messiah. And he continued for two years. Two years. Can you hear this, saints? Two years. That's a long time. He went on with two years. The Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard. You hear this now. All the inhabitants of the province, a province of Asia, Jews as well as his Greeks, heard the word of the Lord concerning the attainment through Christ of eternal salvation in the kingdom of God. Look at that. Everybody in Asia heard the message. See, if you didn't understand your scripture, Jesus could have returned because everybody heard the gospel. The power of the anointing is the power of alignment. Do you know why we did what we did this week? Do you know why and how we were able to take, forgive me, non-professionals 
and turn them into people where I heard myself people saying, those are professional actors. And I'm going, no, they just got a little con in them. Psalm 133, the, look, if you and I, how many of you got your feet anointed last week? Bunch of you, right? Okay, look, look. A song of ascent. Oh, David, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You can't, look at me, look at me. You can't read that and pervert that by saying unity is because you are at your house and I'm here. Read what it says. They were dwelling together. You can't have unity if you ain't hanging out together. When we come together in unity, we become a combine. We become a threshing machine. Come on, are you listening to me? Ezekiel said the same thing. Ezekiel said, I'm coming in a day as such that men will no longer fish with a pole, but they will fish with nets. How do you know you can catch a fish with a pole, but I can catch 500 with a net? Come on, saints. We need to know that we are the machine. We are the net. We are the threshing machine. When we come together, it is like the precious ointment poured on the head that ran down on the beard, even the beard of Aaron, the first high priest, that came down from the collar and skirts of the garments, consecrating the whole body. How do you hear this now? If you read verse 3. It is like the dew of lofty Mount Hermon and the dew that comes on the hills of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, even life forevermore upon the high and the lowly. Here's what you might not know. That scripture is so accurate. Hebron, the tops of Zion, the Lebanese region there has, has these hills and they collect dew. On the mornings, the dew is so thick that you could scoop it up into water. The dew rushes down the hill, goes into the Jordan, and goes into the Dead Sea. That's how much, and it puts in there tens and tens and tens of thousands of gallons of water started out with dew and ends up rushing into the Dead Sea. Saints, look, the anointing flows down. The woman that touched the hem of his garment, she got the greater anointing because it had flowed down. Do you know that when you get the body perspective right, saints, when the head is anointed, uh, come on now, when the head is anointed and there's a flowing down, uh, then the anointing that comes down to the feet gets even more anointed. Are you listening to me today? The modern church today produces fans instead of disciples. The anointing flows down. It is never to be touched uh, by flesh. Uh, it touches the head, uh, those who rule, and then the rest of the body. What we witnessed this week is when God's people get into alignment and proper order and anoint their head, uh, then the anointing falls down uh, until their cup is full. Psalm 23 verse 5 says, Thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runs over. Church has got it so screwed up. God gives every church a head. In a marriage, there's a head. Husband, wife, da, da, da. There's a head. You don't have a head, you got a decapitated thing. If you got two heads, you got a monster but you have a head so that you have a body. And when you have a body, then the body in a right alignment can really walk in the anointing. And every place you walk, uh, your feet are anointed and the oil drops down. And you got your feet anointed here last week. So everywhere you go, the Bible says he gives you as an inheritance where you put your feet is yours. Have you remember who's the inheritance? You are the inheritance of Christ. You're his inheritance. Like I put my wife's inheritance in the bank. 
that's protected. Jesus uh, put himself in you. You're his inheritance. He's going to protect you. He's going to fight for you. He's going to be with you. But you got to understand he's anointed your feet to bring the gospel. There was a young boy who was in an automobile accident in Australia and his head was cut off. His head was severed. All but part, his flesh part, but his spine was cut right off. They took him in surgery for hours and hours and hours and hours. And they were able to sew him and put him back together. They put his head back on. It's the first time. And you know, today, they, they, we saw a thing the other day where a man had lost his hand. They sewed it to the back of his calf. So his hand was hanging off the back of his calf for a period of time so that it could be grafted back into the body. And then they took it and put it back on and they sewed it on and now his hand works. Isn't that marvelous? People that have lost eyes, they've put them back on. People that have lost limbs, they've been able to sew them back on. But you know what, saints? Just as marvelous as that is, there are people today that have lost limbs in Iraq, Iran, how many of these boys and girls have lost their legs? And they left them in a Jeep. They left their leg in a Jeep. They left their arm in some old dirty field because an IED blew up and they lost their arm, left it there. You know, the church goes through the day of life of battle and there are many that are in the body and the limb has been cut off and it's laying somewhere just dying. And God can do a miracle. God can sew you back to the body. God can put you back onto the body where he can graft you in again. He can put you back into that functioning body and make you healthy so that you can be a working member, every joint supplying because we're part of the body.